Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Praise Band. Thank you, Carl, for your service. We appreciate that so very much. God bless you. And uh, thank you for that song. Uh, this is the second time, I think, in a couple of weeks that I've mentioned this, but uh, that song is very special to me. It's, it's also a song that is at the very heart of what we're going to be talking about this morning. But before we jump into that, will you bow with me for just a moment of prayer? Our gracious and loving God, now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our everlasting redeemer. Amen. I don't know if you've ever thought about it before, but one of the most powerful words in the English language is the word yes. The word yes literally has the power to change cultures, determine destinies, and to transform lives. Earlier this week, as I was preparing for this sermon, I started thinking about some of the ways that that one word, that word yes, has impacted my life. And I thought about that time a whole bunch of years ago now, when I was about 10 years of age, it was a summer evening, and I was away at the United Methodist Youth Camp in Leesburg, Florida. It was about 10, 15 at night, and, and the lights went out uh, at about 10 o'clock at that youth camp. And, and so I was lying there on my top bunk, and in the background, the chimes were playing, and they were ringing all the way across the entire campground, and they were playing some of the old favorite hymns that we love to sing, How Great Thou Art, and Blessed Assurance, and It Is Well With My Soul, and some of those other songs like that. Some of you in here have probably never heard those songs. You're too young for those. But, but for me, it was kind of a Norman Rockwell moment. And I remember that at some point while I was lying there on the bunk, I heard that still small voice of God that said to me, will you go for me? And I, it was as simple as saying, yes. And my life as a result of that has been forever different. I thought about that moment when Carol and I stood at the altar of Grace Methodist Church and the minister turned to me and he said, will you have this woman to be your wedded wife? And I said, yes. And then he turned to Carol and he said, will you have this man to be your wedded husband? And he began to pound away. Will you love him, comfort him, honor and keep him? And Carol raised an eyebrow as if to say, you know, the more I'm thinking about this, I'm not so sure. But she said, yes. And as a result, our lives have been forever different. I thought about that moment three and a half years ago when the bishop called me into his office and he said, Dan, will you go to Dunwoody United Methodist Church? And I, I'll confess to you that when he first asked me that question, I had a mixture of feelings. First of all, it was the third time that I would have moved within three years. Two years earlier, I had moved and become the district superintendent of the Griffin District. And then a year later, he asked me to move from that district to the Roswell District. And, and now here we were a, a year later, and he was saying, will you go to Dunwoody? You know, for a Methodist minister to move three times in three years is not usually a very good sign. <laughs> And I was kind of worried about that. And, and then I was a bit intimidated because I knew that the pastor who served this church was one of the greatest preachers that the Methodist church has ever produced and that he had had a long and a very successful ministry. But at the same time, I was excited about the opportunity to, to come and, and serve this great church. And so I said, yes. And as a result, my life and for better or for worse, your lives will be forever different. The word yes is a powerful word and it can have a profound impact on our lives. Of course, there's another very powerful word that can also change cultures, determine destinies and, and impact our lives, isn't there? What word is that? It's the word no, isn't it? And sometimes it's very important to say the word no. And in just a couple of days, the Protestant church is going to 
celebrate a very important anniversary. We're going to be celebrating the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. Tradition has it that on October the 31st, 1517, Martin Luther took and he nailed his 95 theses on the door of All Saints Church. And those 95 theses were, were essentially a no to all of the abuses and, and all of the indulgences that were going on in the Roman Catholic Church at that time. And as a result of, uh, of his nailing those theses on that door, the church has been forever different. Just as it is important to say yes at the right time, sometimes it is very important to say no at the right time. On that day when, when Moses had gone up onto Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments and, and he was delayed in coming back down and the children of Israel came to Aaron and they said, we want you to help us build a golden idol. What should Aaron have said? Oh, you can do better than that. What should Aaron have said? And when David walked out onto that balcony and he saw Bathsheba bathing below and, and he heard the whisper of the tempter in, in his ear, invite her to your place. What should David have said? Yeah. And if you happen to be a Methodist minister and you also happen to be a Georgia Bulldog fan <laughs> and the tempter whispers in your ear, say something about the Georgia-Florida game, what should you say? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, this is, you're supposed to say no at this point. <laughs> you see, saying yes at the wrong time can sometimes get you into a lot of trouble. It, it, it can destroy relationships. It can ruin lives. And it can lead you down all sorts of dead-end streets. Of course, the flip side is also true. If you say no at the wrong time, it can also do great damage as well. The other day, I, I was on the internet and I, I ran across a, an article about a very interesting study that was done on this whole concept of, of the words of yes and, and no. And, and what they did, the study that was done, they took these test subjects and they put them in an MRI machine and, and then they exposed the, the test subjects to the word no for less than a second. What do you suppose happened immediately as a result of being exposed to, to that word no for a split second? It reduced all sorts of stress-producing hormones and neurotransmitters. And these chemically, chemicals immediately interrupted the natural flow of the brain, impairing reason and logic and even our ability to communicate with one another. Now what they also discovered is that when we are exposed to the word yes, it does not have the same effect on our lives because implied in the word no is a threat, but that threat is not implied in the word yes. And so for this reason, they say that if you want to have a productive and a very balanced life, then for every no you hear, you need to hear five yeses. Isn't that interesting? How many no's have you heard today? How many yeses have you heard today? Saying no too many times to other people or hearing other people say the word no to you too many times can have a very detrimental effect on your life. Well, all of which leads to our lesson this morning. In our lesson this morning, we're told that Isaiah had this incredible vision in the year that King Uzziah died. Now, King Uzziah had ruled Judah for something like 50 years. So for Isaiah to note that it was in the year that King Uzziah died that he had this vision was, was like noting that it was a mark in history. It was sort of like saying in the year that John F. Kennedy was assassinated or in the year that 9-11 
happened in this very pivotal year when anxiety was running rampant and uncertainty and fear were high, says Isaiah. I had this incredible vision. I was in the temple and I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And in the ancient world, it was a common practice among pagan religions to take the image of, of their God and to put it on a pole and to raise it high above everybody else. He said, I, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. He said, I saw the hem of the Lord's robe and it filled the entire temple. And again, in the ancient world, a robe was a symbol of, uh, of power and authority. And he, and he said, and I saw all of these winged creatures and, and they were shouting back and forth with one another, holy, holy, holy. And as they shouted, the whole temple began to shake. It's, it's all a reference to the greatness and the power and the magnificence of God. And in the midst of all of this, Isaiah said, I heard the Lord ask, whom shall I send and who will go for me? And at first you remember, Isaiah was reluctant. Why? Well, as he put it, I'm a man of unclean lips and I live in a land of people with unclean lips. In other words, there was something in Isaiah's life that caused him to feel unworthy. What was it? We don't really know for sure. Maybe it was the fact that there was a sin in a secret chamber of Isaiah's heart. Or maybe... Maybe when he was growing up as a child, he heard his father or he heard his mother say again and again and again and again and again and again the word no. And that no just sort of stuck in his heart and it caused him to feel worthless. Or maybe somewhere along the way he had a dream. And one day he began to pursue that dream, but then he failed miserably along the way. And that pain of that failure ran so deep and it left him feeling so unworthy that he didn't ever want to have that experience again, whatever it was. It caused Isaiah to have a profound sense of unworthiness. And, and what's interesting in all of this is that that no that was in Isaiah's heart almost caused him to say no to God at the very moment when Isaiah most needed to say yes to God. I wonder, have you ever had that happen to you? Have you ever sensed that God was reaching out to you, calling out to you and and you just felt too unworthy to respond. Back a few years ago, I had a conversation with a man. He had been attending the church that I was serving, and he'd been attending for about a year, but he just never would join. And one day, we just happened to be talking with one another. And as we were talking, I said, why haven't you joined the church? And there was a long pause, and all of a sudden, he said to me, Dan, if you knew what was in my background, you wouldn't even want me to join this church. Well, I never knew what it was that was in his background, but what I do know is that that no that he felt in his heart was for way too long, keeping him from being the person that God wanted him to be. And this was something of Isaiah's situation. God wanted to do so many things through Isaiah, and eventually he did. But, but at this moment, there were so many things that God wanted to do through Isaiah. And because of this profound sense of unworthiness that Isaiah felt in his heart, he almost passed on the greatest opportunity of his life. So how did God respond? Well, God responded the way, same way that God always responds. He responded to the no in Isaiah's heart with a divine yes. He offered Isaiah his love and his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness. A few centuries later, 
God would send his own son, his own son. Imagine your own son to die because he wanted him to be the embodiment of this divine yes and to prove to everyone once and for all the depth of his love and his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness. But here in Isaiah's vision, he simply uses that, that image of the winged creature taking the hot coal and touching the part of his life that was causing him to feel so unworthy. And, and it was God's way of saying to him, and it was God's way of saying to you and me, hey, I'm setting you free from whatever is holding you back. How does Isaiah respond to this? Well, after Isaiah experiences this divine yes, after he dares to believe that God really does love him and care about him and has forgiven him and offers him God's grace, Isaiah responds with a yes of his own. Here am I. Here am I. Send me. I surrender it all to you. And God does send Isaiah. Now the work that God sends Isaiah to do is not an easy work. In fact, God sends him to share a word with the nation that God knows will not be well received. He sends him to confront the nation with their hypocrisy and their sin. As a preacher, I can tell you, I, I love to preach sermons that I believe will be received well. I love to preach sermons of, in which I seek to try and comfort the troubled. Congregations love those sermons. After those kinds of sermons, many people will come and say the nicest of things. But preach a sermon where you try to trouble the comfortable. And it's not so much fun. <laughs> After it's over, there are conversations and emails <laughs> that nobody likes to receive. The work that God sends Isaiah to do is not an easy work. And if you say yes to God's call on your life. The work that God will send you to do probably will not be easy as well. But two things. First, it will be the most fulfilling work you have ever done in your life. I love the way Pope Francis puts it. He says, don't be afraid to say, don't be afraid to do what God asks you to do. It is worth saying yes to him, for in him is joy. Second, I want to mention to you that whatever God calls you to do, God will equip you to accomplish. God doesn't leave us to our own resources alone. Instead, God jumps into the ministry and becomes a part of it and provides all of the resources we need to accomplish what God has called us to do. Right now, I think of those early disciples right before, the, the, right before Pentecost, right before Jesus ascended to the Father. Jesus called the disciples over to the side, and there were about 120 of them, and, and he gave them a mission to go and transform the world and these disciples they had so few resources and they had such little influence and yet within just a very short period of time they were being referred to as those who were turning the world upside down right now I think of John Wesley when he returned to to England after having left the United States he returned as a broken man but then there was that prayer meeting in which his heart was strangely warmed and then he heard that call to go and to share the good news with the the people in the field and, and in the mines and the seeds of the Methodist church were planted. Right now I think of Millard Fuller. Millard Fuller was all but penniless when God asked him, whom shall I send to the homeless? And he said, here am I, send me. And today Habitat for Humanity spans the globe. And right now I think about this church 
God has called this church over the years to do so many things. I think about Habitat for Humanity. I think about the holiday festival. I think about the great day of service. I think about food stock. I think about the various building programs in which this church has been called. And, and in every one of those cases, when God has called, he has provided the resources to make it happen. And right now, I think about you. I don't know what God's called you to do. I believe to the core of my being that God calls every single one of us. What he calls you to do, that has to be a discernment in your heart. But there is this. Whatever God calls you to do, he will equip you to accomplish and that, my dear brothers and sisters, is the good news for this morning. Let's pray. Our gracious and loving God, we thank you for this time that we've had together. And we ask your blessings upon us. Move in our hearts, even within this moment. Help us to discern what it is you are calling us to do. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. As the band plays.